This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Good evening. Tonight we welcome the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren. He, <laughs> ambassador Oren, like uh, many of the key founders of this university, Roger Revell and Herbert York, is both a man of scholarship and a statesman. And so we're grateful that UCSD students have played a leadership role in bringing them here tonight. It was only a few weeks ago that the leadership of Tritons for Israel began working with the U.S. Israeli Consulate in Los Angeles to uh, bring the uh, ambassador for tonight's speech. So we want to make it a special point of thanking the Tritons for Israel and the Hillel of San Diego for their sponsorship of this evening's event. And in a broader sense, uh, these organizations exemplify the growing engagement of UCSD student organizations with the world. They, through their activities, celebrate Israeli culture and they build a community on campus. They promote travel and study opportunities and they inspire student leadership. We'd also like to thank four additional campus collaborators tonight who have supported this event. The first is the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation the Institute for International Comparative and Area Studies, the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, where I have the pleasure to serve as dean, and UCSD Extension, and particularly the Helen Edison Lecture Series, which is supporting the taping of this event for UCSD TV. Tonight, uh, we will be engaging in the most important duty of the university and the public realm the free exchange of ideas, including ideas that can create controversy because people have strongly held beliefs on opposing sides of an issue. Now, I hope that this advisory is unnecessary, but in light of recent events at a sister campus, I have to ask you to remember that it is our most important duty to protect the freedom of speech. So after the ambassador's speech, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And as the ambassador speaks, it is our expectation that you will refrain from interrupting his talk. With that, I would like to have the pleasure of introducing our Chancellor, Marianne Fox. Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of California at San Diego. Our speaker tonight, Michael Oren, Israel's ambassador to the United States, is here to talk on U.S.-Israel relations from a historical and personal perspective. This program was set up through our student group, Tritons for Israel. The group is dedicated to raising awareness about Israel and Israeli culture, educating students, and promoting peace in the Mideast. I'm happy to see so many Tritons for Israel here and also the students who are involved with Hillel San Diego. I'm proud that our students have embraced the importance of internationalization and have themselves become global citizens. It is crucial that our stu students learn about and understand different cultures, customs, especially in this increasingly interconnected world. The diversity of thought and background are also necessary and positive elements for academic and personal growth. We're delighted to have such company. I also encourage our students to study and work abroad and learn at least one foreign language. By learning languages, cultures, perspectives, and history, we can better communicate with each other, work with each other, and gain a broader viewpoint on life which benefits us all. So please enjoy tonight's presentation. And now I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Sam Spector to the stage to introduce tonight's speaker. Yeah. 
Sam is a Judaic Studies student at UC San Diego, and he's the Vice President of Off-Campus Outreach for Tritons for Israel. After he graduates this year, he will attend rabbinical school at the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. We're delighted to have you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I also want to acknowledge uh, my friend and the president of Trans for Israel, who's joining me on stage, Daphna Barzilai. So please give her a round of applause. <clears throat> it is with great honor that Trans for Israel and Hillel of San Diego welcome to UCSD our special guest, Ambassador Michael Oren. Raised in New Jersey, where he was an activist in Zionist youth movements and a gold medal winning athlete in the Maccabi Games, Ambassador Oren moved to Israel in the 1970s. He served as an officer in the Israel Defense Forces and he was a paratrooper during the Lebanon War. Ambassador Oren was a liaison with the US Sixth Fleet during the Gulf War and he served as an IDF spokesman during the Second Lebanon War. He acted as an Israeli emissary to Jewish refuseniks in the Soviet Union. He also served as an advisor to Israel's delegation to the United Nations and as the government's director of interreligious affairs. He has testified before both Congress and briefed the White House on Middle Eastern affairs. A graduate of Princeton and Columbia, Dr. Oren has received fellowships from the U.S. Departments of State and Defense, as well as from the British and Canadian governments. Formerly, Ambassador Oren was the Lady Davis Fellow of Hebrew University in Jerusalem, a Moshe Dayan Fellow at Tel Aviv University, and the Distinguished Fellow at the Shalem Center in Jerusalem. He has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and Georgetown Universities. Ambassador Oren has written extensively for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the New Republic, where he was a contributing editor. His two most recent books were both New York Times bestsellers. They won the Los Angeles Times History Book of the Year Prize, a National Council of Humanities Award, and the National Jewish Book Award. Oren was named Israel's ambassador to the United States by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last May. It is my distinct pleasure, and I had the chance to chat with him earlier, he's a wonderful man, but it's, uh, it gives me my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce to you, on behalf of Trians for Israel and Hillel of San Diego, Israel's ambassador to the United States, Michael Warren. begin, we have a special presentation. My name is Daphna and I'm the president of Trans for Israel. Thank you all for coming. I hope you're excited for this e event as I am. And, mo and most of all, thank you Ambassador Oren for taking the time to come to UCSD. Trans for Israel is a student organization dedicated to promoting a better understanding of Israel through on-campus education, cultural activities, and strengthening the U.S.-Israel relationship. While our passionate students are dedicated to promoting Israel advocacy, you, Ambassador Michael Oren, have spent your entire life working on this cause. It is my pleasure to present to you, on behalf of our organization, a token of appreciation for your life's work. We also um, would like to make Ambassador Oren an uh, honorary member of Trans for Israel. <laughs> it's even extra large. It's really very good. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Daphna. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you both. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dean Colley. Thank you, Chancellor Fox. Todawaba, thank you all for coming this evening. Please. It could have been worse. It could have been a spear, <laughs> right? <laughs> that would have been interesting. Oh, what a delight this is to come from the uh, sands of the Middle East through the snows of Washington <laughs> to the lush lawns and blue warm skies of Southern California. Really, thank you all for coming. 
Well, as Sam said last May, I got a call from the Prime Minister, newly elected Benjamin Netanyahu. At the time I was teaching in the United States on sabbatical, uh, I'd come back to Jerusalem, he had an offer to make me. He said, would you like to be Israel's ambassador to the United States? And I thought about it for about a nanosecond. <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah. Um, I had grown up in New Jersey, as you heard. I was a member of a Zionist youth movement uh, growing up there. And when I was 15 years old, they took us on our annual convention to Washington. And the height of the convention was uh, greeting the Israel ambassador to the United States. And I'll never forget, he walked in, and we went crazy. We stood up, we cheered, we sang, you know, Shalom Aleichem. And uh, it was really the height of my 15-year-old my life. And I remember thinking to myself back then, that that's what I'd like to be when I grow up. And uh, the ambassador's name was Yitzhak Rabin. And I ended up working for Yitzhak Rabin later in Israel and was working with him until the day of his assassination in 1995, a tragic event. Um, so without a nanosecond hesitation, I said yes, whereupon the prime minister looked at me and shook his head rather ruefully and said, oi, are you going to have a hard job? Then I met our foreign minister, some of you may know him, foreign minister Lieberman is not known for being squeamish, but he looked at me rather ruefully also and said, oi, are you going to have a hard job? And everybody said this to me, I met in the Israeli government and all the way down the line of the foreign ministry to the guy in the basement in the warehouse who signed me off on a cell phone, and I knew he was in trouble when he looked at me ruefully and said, oi, are you going to have a hard job? I'm thinking to myself, why, what could be possibly so hard about this job? Now, I had spent much of the previous three decades studying Amer the history of America's foreign policy in the Middle East, particularly following the evolution and development of the U.S.-Israel relationship. And I knew that that relationship had very, very deep roots. Um, you could trace it back close to 400 years ago, to the early 17th century with the Puritan presence in this country. On the other coast, the Puritans being a, a dissenting Protestant sect that uh, had fashioned themselves and likened themselves to the new Israel. They were the new Israel. This was the new promised land. They came here and imposed the old map of the old promised land on the new one. And that's why if you're on the other coast, you've got a lot of, about a thousand place and city names that have Hebrew names. You have your Sharons and your Jerichos and your Bethels and your Bethlehems on the east coast. Uh, they gave Hebrew names to their children, the Davids and the Sarahs and the Rebekahs and the Isaacs. They made Hebrew a mandatory language at their universities. James Madison was a Hebrew major at Princeton, and he failed. <laughs> um, they put Hebrew in the logos of the university. It's in the logo of Yale, it's in the logo of Columbia. It's in the logo of the University of California, San Diego, let there be light. There's a reason why there's a biblical quote up there, I noticed, part of a great, great tradition. Now these sort of founding fathers and mothers, uh, because they were the new Israel, they felt a certain kinship with the old Israel, and they felt a strong sense of uh, attachment to the old promised land, and they concluded that to be good Christians, later to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained duty to help restore those old Jews to their old promised land. Uh, thus was born the notion of restorationism, which was a very pervasive uh, movement in colonial, post-colonial America. You had you know, John Adams, the second president of the United States, said it was, his, said it was, it was the most ardent wish that 100,000 Jewish soldiers would march back into Judea and reclaim it as a Jewish kingdom. You had Abraham Lincoln in 1863 saying that it was his great wish that someday after America had restored its unity after the Civil War, that he would work for recreating Jewish statehood in what the Jews regarded as their ancient homeland. And so it was with Woodrow Wilson and then Harry Truman and a long line of American leaders who were deeply committed to this notion of restorationism. And that was an instrumental component in American support for the creation of the State of Israel. America became the first country on earth to recognize Israel's independence in May 1948. And then Israel emerged, and emerged as a democracy, a democracy with a strong rule of law, um, fundamental freedoms of expression, of assembly, and there was another layer, additional layer of affinity that was added to this spiritual tie of America, the greatest democracy in the world, uh, felt very attached to the Middle East's only functioning and thriving democracy. But there was no strategic relationship. It's a big mistake. People think that way back in 1948, America was allied with Israel militarily. It's simply untrue. 
1967, there was a Middle Eastern war. America, Israel fought that war without any American weaponry. It was fought with French weaponry at the time. But in the aftermath of that struggle, American policymakers looked at this small country in the Middle East and said, whoa, there's a, a strong anti-Soviet force there. Israel had destroyed about $2 billion worth of Soviet weaponry in that war, and said these American policymakers concluded that we have to be allied with this country. And thus was born the US-Israel strategic relationship, which has burgeoned ever since, uh, to the degree that Today, uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship is probably the most multi-layered, multifaceted, deepest strategic relationship that this country has had with any other foreign nation in its post-World War II period. So I knew all this. I knew about the spiritual ties, I knew about the democratic ties, I knew about the strategic alliance, and then why is it that the prime minister, the foreign minister, and the guy who sells me my, signs off on my cell phone in the basement, why are they all shaking their heads and saying, I'm gonna have a, such a hard job? Well, the fact of the matter is the American people had gone to the polls and uh, they had voted a new president into office, Barack Hussein Obama and his administration, which had an orientation in international affairs that was sort of center, center left. And the Israelis had gone to the polls and they had voted in a government which, though it had elements of the left and left of center in the form of the Labor Party, was by and large a center, center right coalition. So already you had the possibility of a divergence of an American government looking one way, an Israeli government looking another way. But there were specific points in which the Obama administration and the Netanyahu government did not see eye to eye. The first one was the question of the, what we call the two-state solution. That is the vision of a Palestinian state uh, living side by side in a situation of permanent peace and legitimate peace. Uh, with the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, the Obama administration was deeply attached to this vision and wanted to move very, very swiftly on it. They Some talk about a two-year uh, framework for realizing the vision. Um, the Netanyahu government was very expressed at the outset, saying that they had no desire to rule over any Palestinians. We wanted the Palestinians to have all of the powers that were consonant with sovereignty, with independence, with the exception of those powers that could endanger Israelis. We had had some rather unfortunate experience with unilateral withdrawals, first from Lebanon in 2000, later from Gaza in 2005. Israel had undertaken these withdrawals in an effort to generate the conditions which we'd hope would be conducive to peace, and instead of peace, we'd gotten rockets, thousands and thousands of rockets from Hezbollah in Lebanon, from Hamas in Gaza. And if Israel were to agree to the creation of a Palestinian state, it would mean we'd, we would be pulling back from territory that was not adjacent to the sparsely populated uh, Galilee or even the less populated Negev, but really adjacent to our major population industrial centers, all of which would come not only within rocket range, but literally within handgun range. And so it was a tremendous, tremendous risk for us. We further were, fe were fearful that the Palestinian state, when it came into being, wouldn't recognize Israel as a permanent and legitimate state. That there would be Palestinians who would say, well, this is just another stage in the struggle to liberate all of Palestine, and this conflict would just go on. It would never end. We wouldn't have any real peace. So right there, on the basis of, on that plane of the two-state solution, there was a potential for disagreement between the Israeli and the American governments. Beyond that, there was a more specific disagreement over the question of settlements, which we call the communities of Judea and Samaria, which are widely referred to in this country and others as the West Bank settlements. Um, the Obama administration wanted to see a construction freeze in these settlements and also in East Jerusalem, which had been annexed in, is by Israel after the 1967 war. The Israeli government, Israeli government had several difficulties with this position. One, keep in mind, Israel is a democracy. A great number of Israelis view these lands as part of their divinely given patrimony and uh, were not willing to agree to a situation where a Jewish state would tell a Jew that he couldn't live in his own homeland, couldn't build in his own homeland. These were literally our tribal lands, if you will. But there was also a physical limitation. We were talking about several hundred thousand of our countrymen, our citizens, who had normal lives. Uh, if they had a baby born in their family and want to build an addition onto their house or needed to build a nursery school or a clinic, we couldn't freeze their 
uh, lives indefinitely. Imagine a, a city in this country of this comparable size, several hundred thousand people. You say you can't build anything uh, for an indefinite period of time. So there was a potential for disagreement there, too, between the Israeli and American governments. But the greatest potential for uh, a disparity in policies was on the Iranian issue. The Obama administration came into office offering a hand, offering a hand to the Muslim world in general, but specifically to the Iranian regime, um, with an, a, an offer to engage in negotiation uh, with the hope of convincing the Iranian regime to desist from enriching uranium on your Iranian soil. That's always a tongue twister. Bear with me. And that was the goal of the Obama administration. Israel had no problem with the goal. We also wanted to see Iran desist from enriching uranium on Iranian soil. But we were afraid. We were afraid of an open-ended uh, negotiation. We knew how the Iranians tended to negotiate. Drag it on, drag it on, drag it on. Meanwhile, those centrifuges would be turning and churning out enriched uranium. And one day, we feared, we'd wake up and we'd face a nuclear-armed Iran. And a nuclear-armed Iran uh, poses not one, but several existential threats to Israel. It's the existential threat of a regime that has sworn publicly, repeatedly, including this week, to wipe Israel off the map and taking that nuclear weapon and putting it on a warhead with missiles that Iran has, and they can reach every single, middle, every single Israeli city. Beyond that, we feared that a Iran with military nuclear capabilities could pass on those capabilities to terrorist proxies that are supported by Iran, Hamas and Hezbollah. We feared that a nuclear-armed Iran would trigger a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, and other Middle Eastern states would acquire military nuclear capabilities, and soon we find ourselves inhabiting a nuclear neighborhood which would be profoundly, profoundly unstable. So we were very concerned about the Obama administration's position of open-ended negotiations without preconditions with the Iranians. So there we were. That's why everyone was shaking their heads at me and saying, oh, you're going to have a hard job. But I found when I came to back to Washington and took up my new job that what seemed like some very formidable obstacles and challenges facing the U.S.-Israel relationship, that we were able to, one by one, overcome virtually all of these disagreements in a very constructive and ultimately, I think, successful way. On the question of the two-state solution, much of that difficulty was removed by a speech that Prime Minister Netanyahu gave in Israel last June. I was fortunate to have been able to uh, work on the speech. And uh, it was a great experience to work on a prime minister's speech. Someday you should have it. Some of you students of international relations see how a speech like this emerges. But the, the speech expressed support for the creation of a Palestinian state, which was unusual coming from a prime minister who came from a Likud party, expressed support for the, for the creation of a Palestinian state, but with two caveats. They were not preconditions, but caveats that Israel would seek in negotiations a Palestinian state that would be effectively demilitarized. Not quite consonant with the Bavarian notion of, of a, a sovereign state, but this state could have security services, could have police forces, and several thousand Palestinian security forces trained by the United States have now deployed in uh, Palestinian cities, and the Israeli Defense Forces have been able to withdraw from those cities. It's a very successful program. The Palestinian state could have those security forces, but it couldn't have missiles that could shoot at us. It couldn't have artillery pieces that could shoot into our downtown cities. It couldn't have an air force that could shoot down our civilian airliners that were trying to take off and land at Ben Gurion Airport, which would be really adjacent to the Palestinian state. And the Palestinian state could not sign military pacts with hostile powers such as Iran. Beyond that, the prime minister established that the Palestinian state, when it came into being, just as Israel was going to recognize Palestine as the national home of the Palestinian people, that Palestinian state would have to re recognize Israel as the national home of the Jewish people. This was not a tactical demand. All right? This was an attempt to end the conflict, end the claims, and have a real peace that would be durable and legitimate. And the Obama administration's response to the speech was very, very very, very enthusiastic. And, and it's become a source of, of continuing dialogue between us. And it effectively removed that tension over the two-state solution, which left settlements. And settlements proved to be a thornier issue. Um, shortly after uh, coming into office, the president appointed a very capable and very affable envoy in the person of uh, Senator George Mitchell. And I've participated in the Mitchell talks ever since, and it's a great pleasure and honor to work with Senator Mitchell. Um, Senator Mitchell shuttled back and forth, and we were able to iron out a compromise formula where Israel unilaterally, for the first time ever, unprecedentedly, um, froze construction 
of new projects in the West Bank uh, over a 10-month period, again, in an effort to generate conditions which we hope would be conducive to peace talks. At the same time, the Israeli government worked hard to create what we call a bottom-up peace process, that is, generating better economic and security conditions in the West Bank. Um, of course, we couldn't do it in, in Gaza because of Hamas, but in the West Bank, we were able to remove uh, about three-quarters of all the roadblocks, the checkpoints. Today, you can travel from Ramallah to Nablus without running into an Israeli soldier. You couldn't have done that several years ago. Um, we've opened up the Jordan bridges to commerce, and the, as a consequence, uh, tens of thousands of new jobs have been created in the West Bank. And uh, the economic growth estimates for next year are extraordinary. Anything, anything between 8 and 11% growth rate, which is almost unthinkable in uh, today's global climate in the West Bank. Very successful bottom-up process. Um, unfortunately, the top-down process is still stalled. Um, today, the Obama administration and the Israeli government agree that there should be an immediate resumption of peace talks without preconditions. Uh, the Palestinian leadership uh, remains unconvinced that it can gain more from going into negotiations than it can gain from staying out of negotiations. And so now, in the latest round of talks with the senator, I just was involved in these talks just about just over a week ago, uh, we're talking about proximity talks that the, uh, the special envoy will shuttle back and forth between the two sides, not talking about the ways that we can resume negotiations, but actually talk about the subject of negotiations, borders, refugees, the status of Jerusalem and security matters. We hope that that, too, will prove um, conducive to moving forward to peace, which left Iran. There was the stickler. Iran was the really hard issue here. I was present in the Oval Office during the uh, Prime Minister's first visit to Washington last spring, when the President made th several important undertakings, promises to the people of Israel. First promise was that the outreach to Iran would not be open-ended, that there would be a reassessment of the negotiations with Iran before the end of the year, and if it was demonstrated that the Iranians could not be dissuaded from desisting from enriching uranium on Iranian soil, then the United States would join with like-minded nations in the world and impose what Secretary of State Clinton called crippling sanctions on Iran. And on the basis of these undertakings, Prime Minister Netanyahu pledged his support to President Obama. And from that moment on, the Israeli and American positions closely, closely dovetailed on Iran. And there was no, no dissension whatsoever on the handling. So we supported the outreach. And then many things happened. First of all, early on in the administration's uh, tenure, uh, high-ranking members of the administration went out to the Middle East and came back and reported that the Iranian issue was not just an Israeli problem, but a Middle Eastern problem. The Saudis were worried, the Jordanians were worried, the Egyptians were worried. Everybody viewed a nuclear Iran as an existential threat. And there were the events of last June, the upheaval uh, surrounding the Iranian elections. Suddenly, Iran was a threat not only to Israel and Arab states, but also a threat to its own people who came out to, to demonstrate peacefully for democracy. The revelation last October of the Qom secret nuclear facility, which could not have had a civilian purpose, could only have been a military site. And then finally, the negotiations, negotiations which did not prove a compromise. We were involved in actually helping to devise a compromise formula where some of the low enriched uranium in Iran's stockpile would be sent out to Russia and France and sent back for medical purposes. The Iranians rejected that too. And I just in the last few days, they said they're going to upgrade their own enrichment without Western compromise. Uh, and that's where we are right now. Right now, we're at the point of the crippling sanctions. And we have strongly supported the American motion, together with other like-minded countries, particularly in Europe, to move to the Security Council this month to get a fourth resolution on sanctions that will provide a platform for these crippling sanctions in the coming months. Will they work? We don't know yet. We hope. We think the Russians are inclined to be on board. The Chinese remain uh, rather obdurate about not being on board. But we hope that they will work in the long run. Now, I've seen, I've seen over the course of the last seven, eight months how this alliance works in the real world. I've seen how we've approached all of these differences uh, in a friendly, constructive way. Do we agree on everything? We do not agree on everything. Sometimes we agree to disagree, particularly on the issue of East Jerusalem. We've agreed to disagree about it. 
But one thing that this job has taught me, it's been a very humbling experience, I must tell you. You know, you think you come in and you spend three decades studying something, you think you know a lot about it, and then you get into a job and realize that you know very little, that in fact the U.S.-Israel relationship is far deeper and more multifaceted and more multilayered than anything I had ever thought about as a scholar. And it's not just about the cooperation on missile defense. A couple of weeks ago we had 1,400 American servicemen and women training in Israel on a missile system that has been jointly developed of both of us by both countries that will defend not only Israel's skies but defend American forces serving throughout the Middle East. That too, intelligence sharing is a huge issue for us. But it, it goes into the area of economic cooperation. Israel is, a, is America's 20th largest customer. America does more business with Israel than it does with Saudi Arabia, more business than it does with Israel than it does with Argentina or the Soviet Union. Whoever thought of such a thing. Israel is the second most represented country on the NASDAQ exchange after the United States of America. Israel has more scientific patents, more scientific papers, more Nobel Prizes than any country on the earth uh, per capita. Now, Israel has become a primary economic interest for the United States. It's a, it's a, it's a new development. I had no idea myself. So we face immense immense challenges still in the future. We face the challenges of peace. We face the potential dangers of peace. We face challenges to Israel's legitimacy, to Israel's right to defend itself. Some of you may be familiar with the Goldstone Report. The administration has been excellent in joining with us and fighting that report and condemning that report. We face the challenge of a rapidly nuclearizing Iran. But looking back now as an historian and more recently as an ambassador, I know that the U.S. Israel relationship, which has roots that go back not just 42 and a half years to 1967, not 62 and a half years to 1948, but really going back to about 1625, uh, that that relationship has proven extraordinarily resilient, robust, and will be capable, I believe, of overcoming all challenges that are thrown at it in the future. And we can look forward to a future where Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs, and Iranians can join in a productive, peaceful Middle East. I desperately hope. Thank you all. I'd be happy to take your questions. Let's start over on this side, sir. Uh, does it seem to you that um, the Obama administration's response to uh, Iran on the nuclear issue has been mainly ineffective, and that it will be up to Israel to do something about that problem. No, I think that um, the administration's uh, policy, as agreed with, with, the, with, with the Israeli government, we understood that we had to go through steps. We had to go through the process of, of, uh, of convincing the American people, the world, that the Iranian government was not in a position to negotiate, was not going to agree to any compromise formulas, and that once we had persuaded the American people in the world that there was no possibility of reaching a diplomatic solution, that we could proceed to the crippling sanctions. And that is where we are right now. And that is what Israel is committed to, and we are committed to seeing through this process. And again, we are closely communicating, closely cooperating with the Obama administration and other like-minded uh, nations in the world about the sanctions. Um, and you know, I, I've been humbled by being an historian. I know I have enough problems predicting the past. I don't necessarily see where these sanctions are going to go. We don't know yet, but we certainly have to see it through. Um, we're going to go left and right. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Yes, ma'am. Um, West Jerusalem has been ethnically cleansed of its Palestinian inhabitants, both Christian and Muslim. And uh, East Jerusalem is currently being uh, disposed of, of those inhabitants also. When will Israel recognize that uh, Jerusalem is not a Jewish capital and must be shared? by all uh, inhabitants. Well, let me just correct the rather flagrant inaccuracy here. There has been no ethnic cleansing of, of <laughs> Jerusalem and any nation. I live, I live in West Jerusalem. Down the road from me is one Arab village called Surbachar. Down the other end of my road is another Arab village called Jabal Makaber. Across the street from me is a third Arab neighborhood no, called Beit Safafa. All this is in West Jerusalem, so there's no ethnic cleansing. Let's get that straight. Moreover, there are mixed neighborhoods in Jerusalem now, like French Hill. Lots of mixed neighborhoods where Arabs and Jews live side by side. In the old city of Jerusalem, they live side by side. 
Our position is that every Arab and every Jew in Jerusalem has a right to live anywhere in the city he or she wants to live and to build anywhere in that city, anywhere they want to build, as Jews and Arabs have a right to build in San Diego everywhere they want to build. And that's the reality. Now, we have a, pro we have a position. We have a position that Jerusalem should remain the undivided eternal capital of the state of Israel. We believe that we are the only... Based on our historical knowledge, during the 19 years when Jerusalem was not under Israeli rule, where Jews could not pray at their holiest site, which is the Western Wall, we believe that we are the only nation that is capable of, prever of preserving uh, religious freedom in the city. And as someone who worked in the field, I was in charge of church and mosque affairs in this Rabin government, I can assure you that we work very hard to ensure that freedom. We believe that, but I want you to also know that we understand that the Palestinians have a different position. And we are willing to sit down at a negotiating table and discuss Jerusalem face to face. So the invitation is, you know, come and sit and discuss it with us. Palestinians can bring their position. We will bring our position. And we are, you know, we're ready to talk. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, um, I wrote it down. Uh, this past summer, I went to the Gaza Strip to deliver humanitarian aid to Palestinians there, impoverished by Israel's blockade of the region and by the January bombing campaign of which you were the military spokesperson for. What struck me most was the destruction of infrastructure. At night in the south of the Gaza Strip, it smelled of open sewage and burning trash. An April 2009 World Bank, rep World Bank report concluded that Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank have access to one quarter as much water as those in Israel. The average Palestinian has 18.5 gallons of water per day, well below the World Health Organization minimum of 26.4 gallons per day for basic living. The average Israeli has 92 gallons per day. Is there a question day. at the end? As the, occupying force in the as the occupying military force Time. in Gaza, Israel has responsibility under international law to ensure Time. basic standing Time, standards please. of living. <laughs> you say that Israel is acting in self-defense. What I couldn't, I couldn't hear the question. So, what is the, uh, are you denying people access and has the right to self-defense? I'm sorry, I couldn't, hear, because you rushed off at the end, I couldn't hear your question. The, the punch Could you just get, give me yeah, the, put it in yeah, the question? Yeah. What, what aspect of self-defense is denying Palestinians basic access to water? Uh, what, what aspect of self-defense does that fall under? Okay. The UN, the UN today maintains, the UN today maintains that there is no humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The UN, not Israel. There is over, uh, over 100 truckloads of medical supplies and food products go into Gaza every day. There's no shortage of food and medicine. There is a shortage of construction materials, and that we maintain a boycott on. We maintain a boycott on because we know that construction materials that pass into Gaza are sequestered by Hamas and used to rebuild their military infrastructure. It is not only Egypt, not only Israel that boycotts these construction these materials, but also Egypt, because Egypt knows that Hamas will use it to reconstruct its military infrastructure, and that's the reason. We've made some exceptions recently. There were plate glass windows let to go in so that the Palestinian population in Gaza could prepare better for the winter months. We do not view the population in Gaza as the enemy. But we do know that Hamas, the regime that rules Gaza, that overthrew the legitimate government to government in a bloody coup that killed 300 Palestinians, killing other three Palestinians, regards us as the enemy and has a covenant which seeks to destroy not only the state of Israel, but the Jewish people throughout the world. It's a genocidal covenant. I, I, I would urge you to read it. And they have a soldier of ours, Gilad Shalit, now three and a half years, that in violation of international law, there's been no Red Cross visitations of him. We have to maintain a source of pressure on the, on the Hamas regime. And, you know, in the Middle East, sometimes you hear uh, condemnations of Israel's policy in Gaza, but behind the scenes, believe me, Arab regimes are every bit as afraid of Hamas as we are, and with very good reason. It's a dire threat. Again, we do not take any joy in any discomfiture we, we, we may inflict on the Palestinian population in Gaza, but the Hamas government has left us no choice. Next question. Hello. Um, 
In its recent offensive against Gaza, under the pretense of self-defense against rockets, um, Israel banned journalists, killed 1,400 Palestinians, and used internationally illegal white phosphorus, which burns through bones and flesh. Um, the Red Cross reported finding starving babies next to their dying mothers because ambulances were prevented from reaching them. How do you, as the military spokesman for this Israeli military campaign, defend these actions? And please don't tell me Hamas was hiding in the dying babies. Thank you. Israel in 2005 <clears throat> withdrew its military forces from Gaza. It withdrew 9,000 civilians, literally ripped them out of their houses in an effort to create a situation which we hope would bring about peace. We did not get peace. We got 7,200 rockets fired into our civilian towns, villages, and farms. Imagine if a rocket fell in downtown San Diego. What would you expect your government to do? One rocket, not 7,200. And believe me, I've been in those towns when they're under rocket fire. I've been in the shelters. I've seen women screaming, tearing their hair out from it. It's a horror. It's an absolute horror. An entire generation of kids were brought up like that. It was a, it was a nightmare. Israel <clears throat> agreed to a ceasefire. Israeli leaders at the time begged Hamas to renew the ceasefire. Hamas rejected it. They fired more rockets. I had a daughter your age going to school in Beersheba. Beersheba came under uh, rocket fire at the university. One of the shells fell outside of her dormitory. One million Israelis came within rocket range of Hamas. What was Israel to do? Um, ignore it? Go on as if nothing else is happening? So we sent in a force into, into, into Gaza by Israeli army standards, a small force. And yes, Hamas hid. Hamas hid behind its civilian population. It went underground. It hid under hospitals. And unfortunately, and we, take, we, 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 we grieve over civilian casualties, whether there are civilian casualties or Palestinian civilian casualties, it is virtually impossible to fight in a densely populated urban area against an ununiformed enemy that's hiding behind the civilians without inflicting civilian casualties. Now, our statistics differ from Hamas, as you might imagine. We think that close to half of all the Palestinians killed were Hamas operatives of one strike or another, which means a ratio of civilian to military deaths, which is unsurpassed by any military in the post-World War II period fighting in an urban environment. I'll give you a good example. In Kosovo, in the UN intervention in the 1990s, the ratio was four civilian deaths for every, every, every military death. And we did this by leafleting areas where we knew the IDF was going to operate, by sending text messages, giving up the essential element of surprise in order to warn Palestinian populations to the best that we could to flee combat areas. It was not perfect. And mistakes were made. And we opened over 130 cases investigating our own army for potential violations. And 36 of those cases now are still pending. And there have been, there have been uh, guilty verdicts passed down. As for the white phosphorus you mentioned, white phosphorus is used for illumination, for illumination at night. And yes, it should, it, we should be used with great caution. Uh, in urban areas, it is not against the Geneva Convention. The United States uses it as well. But we're investigating. We're investigating to see if there was a, 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 uh, a irresponsible use of white phosphorus. That's the answer. And I would challenge you and urge you to put yourself for one second in Israel's place here and ask yourself, what would you do if there were rockets falling on your hometown? What would you do? Next question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hi there. Uh, you used the term sparsely populated to discuss the uh, ways in which the Palestinian lands were exploited by Israeli people um, and to justify that exploitation. Those are actually the exact same words used um, by governments, early governments in Australia and in the United States to justify the uh, genocidal exploitation of indigenous peoples in those areas. How do you justify that form of genocidal exploitation? You know, I wrote this book called Power, Faith, and Fantasy. I can't plug my own books anymore. It's really sad, but it, I, I must say, called, it's about the history of America in the Middle East, 1776 to the present, and it's now available at fantastically reduced rights on Amazon. Um, <laughs> but I can't plug it. 
But one of the things I did was to go through travel literature uh, by American travelers to the Middle East. And I, I set out a goal of, going, of reading every travel book written by an American traveling through the Middle East in the 19th century. And there was one um, characteristic which appeared in every single travel book. If you want, the best one, best known, of course, is Innocence Abroad by Mark Twain. And they all talk about how depopulated Palestine was. And Palestine was empty. And the fact of the matter is, even in 1948, uh, after 40 years of Zionist enterprise, which brought, by British estimates, not by Zionist estimates, British estimates brought 300,000 Arabs moving into Palestine, almost as many as Jews came into Palestine during the same period. And by 1948, the country had a population of 600,000 Jews and 900,000 Arabs. For a country the size of New Jersey, that is underpopulated. That's deeply underpopulated, and that is by UN estimates, British estimates. Don't look at the Israeli estimates if you don't want to. The fact of the matter is today, Israel, let me finish. You asked your question, you gotta let me respond. Israel's one of the, north of the desert, 62% of Israel is desert. North of that desert, Israel is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Is in fact much more densely populated than Gaza is. Tel Aviv is four times more densely populated than Gaza. But in the Galilee and in the Negev, the southern part, it is not densely populated, it is very lightly populated. The future Palestinian state that I talked about earlier would come into being exactly opposite the most densely populated area of Israel, which is the most, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. It's a point where Israel is eight miles wide, okay? Probably about the width of, 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 of municipal San Diego. And uh, that is a tremendous, tremendous danger. Now, that's it, the Negev, the Galilee were never densely populated. And if you don't believe me, believe Mark Twain. Mm. Thank you. Next question. Mm. Oh. Hi. Um, Israel was clearly sought, clearly sought much of the land of Palestine and its natural resources, disregarding the indigenous population, Palestinians, by taking away their land, creating 120 settlements in the West Bank and 12 in East Jerusalem, and still doing more even though they said they would freeze it. So that four million Palestinians live in 2,324 square miles. When will the Israeli myth that Jews are a people without land and that Palestine is a land without people end? That was a myth. That was a myth. The quote for a people without a land or land without people wasn't a Zionist quote. It was, written, it, was, it was stated by a British uh, Christian uh, statesman in 1848. Um, and we have learned, yes, it's true, it is a myth, it is mythic. There, is, there was uh, and are other people in this land. And as much as we Jews regard the land of Israel as our biblical ancient patrimony, it is, I mentioned earlier, it's our tribal land, it's our only homeland in the world, we also understand that another people regard it as their homeland. And we understand that the only way to end the conflict is by sitting down and negotiating and finding a way of dividing the land. And we think we have pretty much a formula. We're not far away. And we're working for it. Uh, the sad fact of the matter is, and this I will state without equivocation, the Palestinian people hold the world's record for a people that have been offered an independent state and have turned it down and turned it down with violence. They turned it down. I, 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 say that, I, say that, I say that without joy. I want you to know, they turned it down in violence in 1938, they turned it down in violence in 1947, they turned it down in violence in 1967, they turned it down in violence in 1979 when Jimmy Carter ordered them a state, offered them a state, and they turned it down in 2000 when Bill Clinton ordered them a state. A lot of violence, a thousand people died in Israel alone, in what you call the second intifada. We call a terror war. It's tragic. Because in 1937, 1937, 1938, 1947, there was a two-state solution. It was there. The UN approved it, and it was turned down. The Israelis, the Jews accepted it. Now you have another opportunity. Let's not miss another opportunity. Okay? We recognize that. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Um, so after growing up in New Jersey, you moved to Israel to become a citizen and then later an ambassador. And because of your Jewish faith, uh, you're allowed to live anywhere you'd like in Israel. And um, oftentimes, many uh, Jews living outside of Israel are encouraged um, uh, or even paid to move 
to Israel, while at the same time, um, indigenous Palestinian, Muslim, and Christian pop uh, populations are uprooted from their homes continuously. So I guess my question to you is, when will this racial discrimination and uh, injustice end? Thank you. The Jewish state came into being to right a great historical wrong, a 2,000-year-long wrong that culminated in the world's, in history's greatest massacre. And you can consider it a type of, uh, of reverse, of, of positive discrimination for Jews to, uh, to reclaim their homeland and to be able to come home. That's why Israel exists, as a homeland of the Jewish people. There are 22 independent Arab states that can be homelands for Arabs, and we are trying to discuss the creation of yet another Arab state that will serve as a homeland for the Palestinian people. And Israel has one million Arab uh, residents, and they are not being uprooted. In fact, in the 1947-1948 war, they're everywhere where Arab armies conquered where Jews were, not a single Jew was left. But where Israel emerged, 250,000 Palestinian Arabs remained, and they elected members to Knesset, and we have Arab members of Knesset today, we have an Arab Supreme Court judge, um, and they have full democratic rights. But we are trying to repatriate the Jewish people and to redress an historic wrong, and we know the price of that historic wrong. We know it can lead to millions and millions of deaths. But recognizing also that there's a Palestinian people that has a legitimate claim to self-determination, we are trying to negotiate that right now. Next question. Good evening, Ambassador. Thank you for being here, and thank you for taking our questions. Um, I believe you mentioned uh, an Israeli prisoner of war being held right now, um, and uh, over 10,000 Palestinian um, prisoners, uh, including children and the elderly, are being held by Israel right now. Um, Amnesty International, uh, holds Israel as the only country in the world that has not made torture illegal, and hopefully uh, our own country will actually follow, you know, our, our uh, um, how you say, uh, we've made torture illegal in the United States, but hopefully we'll follow that up with action in Guantanamo Bay. But I would like to know um, when Israel will end uh, torture as a, as a system of uh, interrogation. Israel's torture's law, uh, law restrictions against torture are much stronger than they are in the United States. And uh, we've had Europeans come to us and be astonished that our strictures against torture are even stronger than their strictures against torture. And um, American jurists study our system, not reverse. I don't know what amnesty says, but it's wrong. Next question. All right. Um, as someone who is very pro-Israel for Originally, for my origin as an Israeli, and then from studying, and obviously I'm subject to bias like every single human being on this earth. Um, the most frustrating thing to me that I encounter over and over again, uh, um, including on this campus, is dealing with the fact that sometimes when the truth is on your side, it's just not enough. And that's what you get when you get a wealth of misinformation, like with all due respect to our question askers up until now, I think there was an overwhelming amount of misinformation stated in the form of question or disguised as a question. And my question to you is, what do you recommend as some pointers, some tips from a well-established and experienced diplomat Time. such as yourself? Uh, go forth and study. <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's no shortcuts here. Um, you know, when I stand up here, you know, I'm, I'm conveying to you what I hope is more than 30 years. I was a Middle East Studies major. I was an Arabic major starting, oh boy, in 1973. That's a lot of years uh, put into this and study. And it's um, also, I had the advantage not just of sitting in a classroom, but being out in the field and crawling through some of those fields, which can influence your political views as well. Um, and uh, I have seen how through my reading, my study, my own political beliefs and my ability to, to defend Israel, but also understanding the other side, which I hope I'm conveying tonight to a certain degree, that, uh, that that is reflected. And I think that that's it. Go forth and study. I think we have time mm. for one Hi, um, I wanted to know what you think about the suggestion that American progressive Jews, specifically organizations such as J Street, oppose Israel, and what Netanyahu views on that topic. 
I don't think J Street opposes Israel. J Street defines itself as a pro-Israel organization. We've had some issues with J Street over security issues, but most of them have been ironed out by now. Um, as a matter of fact, I want you to know that J Street issued a statement today that defended my uh, ability and right to speak on California campuses. Uh, <laughs> you so I, I, on that point, if I may, um, I've really enjoyed this tonight. I mean, you've asked some very, very hard questions, and I want you to know that I come to campuses. I can go many places. I can go speak to the local chamber of commerce. You know, I can you know, speak to Jewish groups. Certainly, it's easy. I come to campuses to hear the type of questions that I've heard today, and it's important that I listen to you as well as that you listen to me, and this is a great, great country. And what this country has in common with Israel, among the many things, is our respect for the freedom of speech, even though we don't agree with one another. And we've had an opportunity, I think it's a, a great testament to, uh, to you, Dean Crowley, you, Chancellor Fox, to uh, US, UCSD, that we've been able to have this conversation tonight, as difficult as it's been, um, without interruption, and have a civil discourse. I think that's, uh, I really, uh, I've really enjoyed this and appreciated this tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.